am Sean from Dartmouth, and I'm keeping you from lunch. Uh, what am I talking about? Uh, and with some clip art that I failed to, to uh, acknowledge from a free site. OK, so thinking about computer-mediated access to data and services. Uh, you know, and so thinking big data, oh, I want to work with this database, this big thing, or small things, or investment banks, or all sorts of you know, enterprises. And uh, kind of the textbook view is that, oh, you know, <laughs> there's somebody who has a notion of, ah, oh, that's a good usage. That should be allowed. And, uh, oh, oh, that's a bad usage. That should be prohibited. And so, you know, we have this fiction that, oh, you know, this some the stakeholder, the security officer, somebody will be able to have in their head this idea of what should be allowed and what should not be allowed. And then we, the computer security tech community, will give this person a big fancy set of knobs, and they can set the knobs to configure the policy for what they'd like, and then that policy governs what actually happens in practice. And this is, this is, a, this is what textbooks say. This is how I thought it worked. Uh, then about 10 years ago, I was able to send some students, embed them in some large investment banks, and then we started going to other places uh, and discovered, no, it's, it's not like this at all. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, we even had the CISO of one bank laughing at us, saying, you people, <laughs> you think we can stop what we're doing, put everybody in a room for two weeks, and work out what the policy should be, and then you assume that if we, even if we could do that, that it would actually stay accurate for more than a day or so. Uh, it's just ridiculous. Uh, so one of the things that happens is people, not malicious people, people trying to get their jobs done will find, oh, this, this doesn't work. You know? <laughs> uh, and uh, in order to get their jobs done, they'll work around the system. Uh, and so you find just endemic circumvention everywhere. So one gap right away is that you know, what the, the policy that this officer had in mind doesn't really match reality anyway. Uh, you know, so if you're trying to reason about how many em employees of your firm will be able to access my data if I hire you for my back office services, you can tell how many employees the, the policy might say, but it doesn't match what's really going on. Uh, and there's also a lot of reasons to think of, you know, gee, we assume that people can actually craft the knobs to match what's going on in their head. And there's a lot of evidence to show that that doesn't work either. Um, one investment bank, we had a uh, uh, copy and paste provisioning. You know, people would just say, oh, <laughs> Bob came into my group. Oh, I have to give him some permissions. His job is kind of like Alice's. I'll just copy and paste Alice's policy over to Bob and see if it works. Uh, without really knowing what the things mean. It's great. Well, great from, <laughs> depending on your point of view, from a researcher who loves when things don't quite work right. It's great. Uh, so we have this problem. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, so I've been working with a um, uh, uh, crossing disciplines. I guess I've been a believer since, well, since forever of uh, you know, you know those signs at an amusement park that say you must be this tall to go on this ride. So if you're chasing the truth, you must have this kind of background to chase to go beyond this point. That you know, you have to ignore that, and you have to follow the truth where it takes you. So I've been part of a team uh, co-led by Jim Blythe at USC and Ross Capel at Penn, and then with our hardworking grad student and a stream of undergraduate interns. I was trying to think of the right collective noun for that. A gaggle, a herd. Uh, we've been looking at using tools from all over, computer security, sociology, ethnography, and some other fields to try to look at this issue. And we needed a logo, so I went to hipsterlogo.com and got, that's our logo, shucks, the science of human circumvention of security. Uh, OK, so now a couple of things. Um, trying to keep you from, not keep you delaying too long. Field work and observation. So one of the things we did with Ross as an ethnographer and sociologist who knows how to go and do interviews and observations, we did a lot of interviews and observations from lots of different places. Uh, had a f also able to look at help desk logs, a bunch of things, and found basically, as you might expect, uh, circumvention is endemic by people who are trying to get their job done. Uh, Policy use surveys show when do people believe it's justified? Well, whenever they want to do it, basically. Um, 
And uh, okay, so what are we, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, so we started looking. Ross and I had uh, some work. We were looking at usability of medical IT and thought, you know, there's kind of these three things going on here. There's what's in, you know, the clinician's head about the reality. There's how this reality is represented in the computer system, the EMR, the EHR that the clinician's using, and then the actual reality. And, you know, we wrote this paper. It actually got a best paper award twice. We were happy about that. Uh, and in computer science, you sometimes are scared about getting scooped. At least I remember being terrified about being scooped when I was a grad student. Well, it turned out we were scooped by almost a century. Um, the semioticians, uh, Ogden and Richards and others, had this sort of thing in terms of language. And in some sense, you think about what's, what's going on in our computer systems is we are trying to express in symbolic terms something about our, what we think about what's happening in the real world. So language might kind of work, uh, although we do have the case that uh, the expression actually can influence the reality, which I guess, you know, in, in terms of language, we gave up on that in the 1600s or so, um, the idea of spells and things. Um, and the language talks about morphism, the idea that as you move between these representations, uh, you should have mappings that preserve structure. Uh, and so we found, you know, gee, when you think about circumvention and security, what's really interesting is mismorphism. And spell checkers complain about that. But you know, mappings that fail to preserve structure in some critical way. So after we had gone through and cataloged and all these uh, interesting, <laughs> I shouldn't say they're interesting, occasionally deaths result, but they're interesting <laughs> uh, ways that people work around systems and break things to make to get their jobs done. Uh, yeah, circumvention. It, it, mismorphism is kind of key to a lot of that. Um, you know, one way, you know, that we see this happening is that, well, the administrator has some mental model that, oh, this should hold. I want this property to hold of my system. And so they go in and, and because they have that in their head, they, they can figure the IT to do something and then that generates reality. And maybe, you know, if they're really lucky, that property actually holds in the reality. But, you know, the, my sister used to work for a bank and she didn't like the bank and she talked about how the bank's attitude was things would be just great if we didn't have all these customers and so similar this system might be great if you didn't have actually any users but there are users and uh, the users say oh this reality doesn't allow what I really needed to do it doesn't match their mental model um, so then they change the reality and this is a uh, an upside down styrofoam cup and this refers to an incident at a large teaching hospital that we were able to do a lot of observation I just heard I can end sentences with prepositions. We were able to do observation at. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, and uh, uh, they were worried about information leakage because people would come in and, and log in and do some medical stuff and then walk away and leave themselves logged in. Um, so they put proximity detectors uh, and had automatic timeout so that it stayed logged in as long as you were within the proximity detector. But if that would allow you to turn and talk to a patient and then turn back because patients didn't like it when the, <laughs> the clinician would never talk to look at them because they had to type in their laptop. Um, and uh, what happened was uh, pretty soon all the proximity detectors had styrofoam cups over them so that they always registered proximity. Uh, and uh, so in this sense, you know, the, if the, when the administrator was trying to decide what timeout should I use to, to minimize disclosure, yeah, a half hour timeout would have been far better than a five minute timeout because half hour wouldn't have engendered this, this workaround. Uh, of course, you don't know this is even happening until you walk around and look at the, uh, look at the styrofoam cups. Um, so properties, properties that get lost. Uh, you know, one property is, I remember from my math days, monotonicity, the idea that you know, <laughs> if I dial things better, then 
hopefully they get better. They at least don't get worse. Uh, and so I have some tunable security parameter. Um, where should I make my timeout tighter? That should make security better. Should I require people to change their passwords more often? That should make it better. Should I require a longer password and have more complex rules? That should make it better. And that's kind of what maybe is the wisdom. And then what reality ha we find happening is, gee, you know, <laughs> you tune it up and actually things get worse. Um, we were calling this, initially we wanted to call this on the uncanny valley uh, because it's a concept from graphics where as you increase the realism in graphics, there's this period where it, people find it actually creepy and then they finally adopt it. Uh, and then VJ said, no, you can't call it the uncanny valley because valley suggests that there actually gets better at some point. Uh, so we call it the uncanny descent. Um, let me keep an eye on the time here. And, uh, you know, so a lot of examples of that. Timeouts, password practices. You make people uh, <laughs> have more complicated password rules then more people write their passwords down. That could be a problem. Uh, or issues where people, um, gee, there's more complicated password rules. Uh, people will start, nah, I had to change my password again. I'll make it the same as the one over there. And we found other examples as well. On, uh, on canny ascent, where you make things worse and it gets better. Um, some of the online services did not like this password, QWERTY QWERTY. But if you started truncating it and making it shorter, they liked it. So the security was better when you had a shorter password. Um, a colleague who worked actually in an industry not that far from here as, as a vice president of whatever, InfoSec something, I'll wave my hands because I'm not sure the precise title, uh, discovered that a lot of the executives at this, this, this corporation were sharing their passwords with their administrative assistants. He discovered this because he was talking to administrative assistants. You, know, you can't just stay. You have to actually go look in the real world to see what's going on. He didn't like that. That's bad. You know, that was bad. Um, so he decided, ah, you know, you have your executives, you have your, your work services, and you have your personal, you know, benefit services. I'm going to re require now that these have the same password. So you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to have different passwords, different kind of things. Requiring the same password actually made them stop sharing it. So uncanny ascent, making security worse actually made it better. Um, uh, yes. Um, loss of continuity. Uh, the idea that, oh, if I just uh, change a little bit my configuration, that'll only make a little change in security. And, uh, you know, little, little changes can make actually big changes. There's several examples. I'll just show this one of just, gee, if you post a Wi-Fi password, and this is uh, the one that the control center for the Super Bowl, uh, and there happens to be a video camera coming into the room, well, now that little small change, the video camera, has made a huge change. Um, other sorts of things. This is one of the few times I get to use the word rectal polyp in a computer uh, security discussion. Um, a friend of mine has a, uh, a colleague and friend uh, has controls a domain name that differs by one letter uh, from the domain name of a very large New England teaching hospital and uh, gets a lot of things sent to that domain name, sent to his, which is one off, including photographs of rectal polyps that he, well, he said he didn't actually open the photos. He assumed that's what the cover letter said they were, being sent securely to the wrong person. Um, that's sort of possibly humorous, but there's, there's deaths that have resulted as well from this sort of user interface bizarreness, a slight issue, uh, making it easy to, easier to add an extra zero in, a, uh, in the medication dosage, a death, and I think then a suicide as well uh, of the clinician who did that. So these things can have, have serious consequences. Small changes make big differences. Um, another kind of phenomena we've identified as you know, action at a distance. So you have, you know, oh, I, I think I control my system. My policy that I set affects, that's what determines the reality of my system. Yay, that's great. Except again, these annoying users, and users may use multiple systems, and uh, maybe another admin doesn't quite have the same sort of policy. Um, and if, and the issue is, gee, 
users, common users might go, oh, I was trained to accept this worst set of best practices, so I'll apply them at your site as well. And suddenly, you know, the Alice and Bob, at, at good Alice, uh, discovers that, if she's really thinking about it, her security is negatively affected by something that happened at a system that she had never heard of and didn't really work on at all. Um, example of this, uh, a colleague at a uh, defense lab uh, said that they were actually trained. Oh, for this experiment, it's okay to accept the self-signed cert from on, on the web page. That's fine. And you know, you might be fine if it was a sufficiently closed network and protected. But then how many of those people went off and when they were doing banking and other things said, oh, we were told by, you know, I work in a secure environment and they said it was okay to do this. So I'll, you know, so how do those policies cross? Uh, Dartmouth made a big thing about thou shalt never type thy password into the, the our one password that rules it all into any pop-up window until you start using SharePoint there or the way they like us to share data, in which case, oh no, except for that one. So how, what happened? Um, people sharing passwords across sites. Uh, you know, if, <laughs> uh, if another site has a password weakness or releases on hash passwords, which I'm gonna say, no, they never do. Yeah, it happens all the time. Um, then uh, uh, does that threaten your site? You need to think about this. Um, so again, yeah, so mismatches between reality and models can lead to circumvention. And then circumvention, I'm reading the slide, can lead to significant mismatches. So what do we do? How do we move as the field from fantasy-based cybersecurity to evidence-based cybersecurity? You know, fantasy-based is based on the assumption that the policy, actually in, in the policy as configured actually matches what was intended, and the policy as configured is what the users actually do. Uh, so what do we do? So one thing we're looking at trying to um, build tools to try to evaluate aggregate security before you deploy it and discover, oh, now it's too late. Uh, and so this is where uh, Jim Blythe comes in, his work on agent-based modeling. So we're working on building, using the tools of Dash, uh, which, okay, it's a recurse, it's an acronym that stands for deter uh, agents simulating humans. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, so it's using the deter distributed simulation uh, framework, but then to have computational things that try to reproduce a little bit of, of human behavior, such as the dual process model or looking at cognitive I just, uh, okay. Well, this was, I wanted to keep this part private. Uh, I presume it's what inside my quote now. Here it is. I blame EMP for that. Um, so, so what can we do? So we've done some work in there looking at uh, using Dash in the agents in this larger setting uh, to look at, you know, okay, what are we just starting some basic stuff with human password behavior? How can we, can we look at cognitive burden? What happens when the cognitive burden gets to a certain point? Uh, do people start uh, reusing passwords like they're not supposed to? And uh, we got a few results there. Um, some other, other work, and that, that work is ongoing. Some other things we looked at is, you know, this idea in the beginning, this idea that, oh, if I have some set of goals, and I, have, and I can turn the knobs uh, to set my policy, that they'll actually reflect my goals. Uh, so here we looked at, um, you know, the problem of expressing what we want. Uh, so this is a, uh, from the medical world, uh, a well-known case of a young woman who was admitted to a hospital and apparently at some point or another, um, at least according to some versions of the story, uh, her family did not disclose that she was on antidepressants, or her friends didn't disclose, and her friends didn't disclose that she had taken cocaine. And these, you know, because how, why is that relevant to her being in the hospital for this stuff? And it turned out it was very relevant. Uh, led to a lot of other things, but that was one of the, oh, gee, what should you disclose? Or, gee, should you, <laughs> why should I ever, why should I tell uh, my heart doctor anything about my teeth? How can that be relevant? Well, it turns out it is. Um, so, so how do we, so how do we, uh, gee, 
people, you know, if you're going to have them write down and express their policy, if you're going to have the, oh, a patient says, you can only use my data in ways that I said it was okay. Do, is that the right way? How do we express this? So one thing we did in this space is we looked at um, an, old psych, an older psychology result. Old. Actually, it's from the time when I was at IBM, so that doesn't seem that old at all. But uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, looking at how, uh, uh, how people made judgments about taste, in this case, taste of jams. Uh, and uh, so we said, oh, this is this wilson Schuler result. Oh, let's try this psychology result with, uh, with college, modern college students looking at a fictional social network. Uh, I wanted them to do power grid stuff, but it's hard to train college students students to understand the power grid. So OK, so we did fictional, we did social network. Uh, and yeah, these are with, the, with my colleagues, including the starting pitcher of the softball team, uh, who was a lead author on this. So, so we looked at, um, OK, so the user has some privacy preferences they'd like. And we'll give them a bunch of knobs for the social network to say, hey, <laughs> do you want to, uh, uh, how do you feel about letting these people see this privacy stuff? Um, Except, of course, uh, you know, we, we did invite the two groups. You know, and that leads to, you know, there's been jokes today about the science march in the weekend and whether they had a control group as well, where they were marching for something else. And then you see the, uh, but so the control group, we gave them a questionnaire about choosing a major. And then they made, gave them a bunch of things. We made them have them make access control decisions. Would you like to share this category of your private information with this person who has this connection to you far or near? Um, and the introspective group, we actually gave them a questionnaire about Facebook privacy. We made them think about privacy issues. And, uh, and, uh, what happened, uh, I kind of skipped the, the graphs in the interest of time, is that um, the people who we talked made think about privacy actually made quantitatively, statistically significant worse decisions. They were much more likely to give things away. <laughs> Don't know why. Uh, in the post feedback questionnaire in the control group, then many said, oh, geez, I want to go back and, and uh, 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 tighten my settings up. I'm sorry, the control group. That was the one who were actually, um, who actually were, we didn't give any education. We didn't think about their major. In the introspective group, maybe said, ah, our, our settings are fine. So I don't know. Intra. Uh, another thing we looked at, and this is with uh, another undergrad and, uh, and uh, the gentleman who had been the head of medical. Yes? Can you just go back one, one slide? So do you have a, did you follow up on this to try and figure out what? Uh, I followed up in the sense that I've kind of wondered, initially I thought, oh, this is, maybe it's a dual process thing, but then given this notion, oh, uh, everybody here in the system is called a friend. Uh, so it may have been one of these reduction of cognitive dissonance. Why would I deny a friend access to something? Or maybe it's that they felt inclined, I should share a friend in the first place, and I have to construct a reason to deny. So we, a follow-ups I would like to do, which I haven't yet, are looking at what if we call them something other than friends? But, but I guess my question is, sort of what, what led to the difference between well, if it's the classical dual process thing, it would be something like, I need to, I have a gut feeling of what I want, but I need to, oh, if I'm going to actually write it down, I have to, if I'm going to make it quantitative, if I'm going to actually articulate it, uh, I need to construct some reasoning for it. And making them think about privacy disrupted their ability to construct reasoning. It's similar to what happened with, with jam, when people who, uh, oh, I like this jam. But if you said, here's all the, question, here's all the criteria that, that taste people use, to, you know, experts use, and when they actually start thinking about the criteria, their initial gut feeling got confused as they were trying to articulate in terms of the criteria. So making people take a gut feeling and set knobs to formally specify it, at least in cases of jam and uh, privacy settings, appeared to, and actually this is a little bit of what, um, a little bit of what Privacy Bird learned as well seems to have uh, have some problems. Another area we looked at, and this is, was in medical, was in EHR, um, and this was I was fortunate to collaborate uh, with the medical head of informatics of our local hospital, who is now down in Washington doing national level medical privacy stuff. Uh, you know, and what happens often in um, 
well, many hospitals will actually say, yeah, we don't really have an access control policy. If you're authenticated, then you can see everything. Because if we deny you access and you needed it, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe people will die. It's so hard to get right, and the consequences are bad. Um, but in places that have had it have said, found that, um, gee, you know, when we, people, when the pop, users in the actual hospital setting find that the policy is too constricting, I need to see this patient's data. We need medical clinicians uh, in, in the policy setting. So we said, okay, let's do this. Five minutes left. Uh, let's do, take a bunch of medical scenarios uh, where users have a, you know, there's certain kinds of data and this clinician wants to see this data uh, and phrase it as an abstract policy GUI should uh, I think I've got some examples here. Uh, in the full version of the three hour version of the talk, there are examples uh, of um, uh, should you be able to see this kind of patient, if you're dealing with a patient for this kind of alcohol issue, should you be able to see this other stuff? Uh, and then subject, the exact same scenario, uh, but with um, it's this, you are this doctor, you are in this setting, you are seeing this patient, should you be able to see this data? Uh, and we were able to get a few hundred um, actual uh, users of EHR to take this study. Uh, so here's an example, yeah. It is appropriate that the hospital privacy policy give local addiction treatment programs full access to a medical record. And then the same thing, but very specific. You are this doctor, you are treating Erica Brown, she has this sort of, it. you know, so <laughs> dealing with a policy committee's question, version of the question and a clinician's version of the question. And yeah, as you might expect, um, we uh, found that, generally speaking, uh, uh, the subjective group, the group that said, you are, you're in the, you're, you're the actual, it's Erica Brown, should you be able to see your data? Often, you know, largely found that, uh, this, oh, gee, this policy is too, constri it's too tight, I better work around it, because I need that data. Uh, suggesting that reasonable EMR users will make policy decisions that reasonable EMR users will find constraining. Uh, so just including them in the creation process is not sufficient. Maybe we should give them a shim to say, oh, you want to set the knobs this way? Boop. Here's a scenario. Imagine you're in the scenario. Is that okay? That might be enough. I don't know. We also found a few, there were a couple subset where some, some small cases where the subjective group said, no, it should be, I shouldn't be allowed to do this. It should be tighter. So that was kind of strange. Uh, okay, next steps. Um, we're uh, both trying to get a lot more data uh, to actually drive uh, the dash modeling. Um, we just got IRB approval to start some Mechanical Turk stuff to kind of actually figure out, hey, can we get some real numbers on? If we tell you not to create, to have different, who tell you to have different passwords for different services, how often will you have them the same password anyway? If we make you change your password for service X, will you change Y to be the same? You know, and actually get some numbers for this to, to drive to then plug into our modeling. Uh, we've also extending uh, some the modeling framework to allow, basically, I'll read the slide, automatic reasoning about the link between data, to make the tools to make the simulation, they make the experiment work, work a lot better to get to find out where are the sensitive variables, where can, where should you look more? Um, yeah, and can we, can we, you know, get, replace uh, evidence-based, can we replace fantasy-based security with evidence-based security? So, so, thanks. There's more about me there. A recent book and the only security textbook with the word craptastic in it. Um, so, now questions and lunch. Yes. So, the jam versus, uh, you know, uh, Facebook. Uh, or the, the attempt to apply the, the preference modeling used in, in jams to uh, privacy preferences for Facebook. I wonder if there's a bit of a mismatch in, in that one is, is uh, constructing preferences based on an immediate taste sensation, another is uh, with respect to risks in the future. And um, I think those are, those are different kinds of cognitive processes. And one thought that occurred to me is the uh, there's a literature suggesting that descriptive uh, uh, presentations of risks 
produce the, the typical prospect theory kind of curve there where people are overvaluing unlikely but consequential outcomes, whereas when people have experienced an outcome over and over again, then a different kind of a curve tends to show up. And so one of the parameters, if you were interested in investigating that line of thought, one of the uh, ways in which you might want to do that is by people who've actually experienced anything having to do with privacy, yes, you know, uh, violations and consequences of them, uh, versus people who are, it's a purely abstract theoretic theoretical kind of a thing. That would be, and I guess another difference from the jam stuff, the jam stuff, the uh, subject, the, the group that actually had a introspect and it was two-sided error. And we found only one-sided error uh, that, you know, people were very, very extremely loose. They, they, we didn't find them spread out, uh, which also suggests there's something different going on. Anybody else? Okay, thank, thank you. you.